Hi, dear listeners. This is Kate Riga. I'm here to make a quick pitch that you consider becoming a TPM Prime member. TPM has used the member model for over a decade now, and our loyal members are the only reason we've been able to weather the turbulence of the media landscape and avoid the fate that has befallen so many other independent outlets. For $70, you get no paywall, fewer ads, access to the Hive member forum, a member-only newsletter, and more. For $140 a year, you get all of that plus no ads at all. Without our members, there is no podcast, not to mention that I am out of a job. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We couldn't do it without you. Hello and welcome to Belaboring the Point. I'm your host, Kate Riga. Today, I'm joined by TPM's own Josh Kavinsky. Josh, welcome. Hi, Kate. Thanks for having me. (laughs) So today, Josh and I were joined by Professor Gerard Magliocca to talk about uh, the disqualification clause and the upcoming Supreme Court arguments about you know whether or not Trump will be booted off the ballot. Um, so, Josh, what would you make of the conversation? So I, it was really interesting. You know, Gerard is like he would basically before January six, before Trump, he was like a preeminent authority on Section three of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, <laughs> a great person to it's talk crazy. to, and, yeah, which is very funny. And like there are a number of people like this in the world who like. I remember one time I was talking to some guy who was an expert on. Um, how um, the 25th Amendment that like, uh, dis- you know, if a president's disabled or uh, anyway, he was like that guy. And then January mm-hmm. 6th happened and all of a sudden he had like thousands of journalists calling him. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think happened to Gerard too. But, you know, he the conversation, I think, demonstrated something interesting with this issue, which is that, you know, as you said during the conversation, Kate, the conventional wisdom is that the Supreme Court is just absolutely not going to disqualify him. But like one thing I've noticed is that when you talk to people who are either very familiar with the 14th Amendment or very familiar with the court or in Gerard's case, both, they end up being more like, well, we don't really know what's going to happen. And maybe it's like, you know, yeah, they're probably not going to disqualify him, but maybe there's still kind of a chance they will, right? Like they end mm-hmm. up being much more open to the idea that it might happen. And that definitely, I think, came out in this conversation. I found that really interesting. Totally. Because there are like some topics where at this point with this court, it's just, it's like a foregone conclusion, basically. You know, it's like anything like with Biden agencies acting aggressively, like this court probably will knock that down. And, you know, all, all the stuff like that. But this one is just so weird because it is like so unprecedented. And most of our case law is from, you know, post Civil War America. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it is like con- there are these constitutional issues, which just like, I mean, it's like, it's almost a cliche to say this with Trump because he's like pushing the envelope so much on like all forms of government. Um, it is raising these issues that like have only ever been encountered theoretically and not really practically. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's like, which is like mind, it's like a mind fuck in one way, but in other ways, it's like, totally it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And like, to some degree, I mean, we don't want to be naive about this, like, you know, them kind of issuing something super sweeping, which like de facto kind of eliminates Trump from the ballot. Like that still seems unlikely to me, even if we're not sure where he'll come down, just because they have so many more off routes where they can kind of like even not come down exactly how Trump wants them to and still, you know, not do something like so sweeping that it just ends his presidential campaign and like for all intents and purposes by that point you know throws it to biden yeah right they have a lot of off ramps um yeah. and you know one of the things that like came out of the conversation too is that almost regardless of what happens january 6 2025 is going to be chaotic like for the basically for this reason um mm-hmm. because there's going to be this live question of like you know is one of the candidates um like was he just like was he like disqualified and especially if trump wins like I mean, it's going to come up in a way that like, in like a very, in sort of a weird way, right? Because like we had like all of these people bringing these like fake issues before um, Congress on January 6th, 2020, 2021. Um, and like in some regard, in some sense, it's going it, to, it, it's almost going to be like a repeat of that, but where there's an actual con- like controversy to be resolved. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then just the other piece that was interesting, which he actually said back when you and I were writing about this, when it was like kind of the new hot buzzy thing like way before it kind of got up to the supreme court but um he said at the time that like he thought legally the question was like pretty easy pretty straightforward like by the kind of plain reading of the text it's pretty obvious that trump is disqualified um but i really kind of liked how he put it towards the end of our conversation that's like 
people oftentimes like don't want to do what the 14th amendment says they have to do. And we've seen like decades of jurisprudence kind of driving home that same point, whether it be, you know, like redist gerrymandering or, or kind of like this whole host of issues that are kind of housed under the 14th amendment. Um, so it, it is funny how that like psychological element is so at play here that we can be like, Oh, it's, these are just complex legal questions, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, okay, sure, but there's a huge amount of, like, unprecedented action to take here, and that's, like, obviously has enormous bearing on this case as well. Yeah, and I think, like, in terms of, like, the commentary around it, you know, all the mm-hmm. everybody's sort of immediate, immediately saying they're not going to do it, and, yeah. um, you know, in fact, if and even if they did, it would be bad for democracy. Like, I, I do mm-hmm. kind of think, in a weird sense, it almost... Um, ratifies like what the Supreme Court is most likely to do because then it's like because I think you're right Kate like if you look at this just like or as Gerard was just kind of straightly as a question of law and like don't think about anything else about partisan politics or you know whatever the consequences might be it's like fairly straightforward that the only real question here is whether or not January 6th Trump's actions on January 6th before then constituted him engaging in, in insurrection right and like there's a really really strong argument in fact he, uh, under the you know section three of the Fourteenth Amendment, he did. So I, 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 I just kind of think that like it, the way it's discussed sometimes almost like creates this aura of inevitability that the Supreme Court is going to do the thing that we all kind of expect them to do, and that it, you know if and when they do not de- decline to disqualify him, it does make it, it it almost makes it seem less radical because at the end of the day, I think that there's a way to totally without being naive you know, expect the most of, expect justices to be independent arbiters of law, right? Yeah, totally. And I mean, and as he pointed out, that kind of instinctual, like, no, let's preserve the status quo. Let's not, you know, let's not follow the 14th Amendment where it leads when it entails, like, shaking things up in a big way. Like, when, when the court has done that historically, as he said, it's left people to suffer, right? Like, that's exactly kind of how you justify not... Uh, fulfilling people's full civil rights because it would like shake up society too much right it would be controversial yeah and it it, it reminded me to something else he said which was that you know in the 19th century like insurrections were actually like relatively common like compared Mm -hmm. to like where we are now where it's like this you know once in a lifetime once in a lifetime experience right Uh, (laughs) (laughs) living through an insurrection wow but uh yeah you know but but it also like to your point it it just cast the it it cast section three in in a different light where it's like this isn't necessarily this isn't like this wasn't for them for the people who wrote the amendment and and the congress enacted it It, you know it wasn't like something that was completely out of the norm like this was like a response to something that uh, that not only happened in the civil war but like it happened in other you know instances in american history and living memory before them right Okay, so here's our conversation with Gerard. Um, It was a good one. I hope you all enjoy. Today, TPM's Josh Kavinsky and I are joined by Professor Gerard Magliaka. Gerard is the Samuel R. Rosen Professor at the Indiana University Robert McKinney School of Law. He's one of the nation's leading experts on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and is the author of five books on constitutional law. Uh, His next book will be about Justice Robert Jackson's landmark concurring opinion in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. Gerard, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah, we were talking uh, right before we went on air about the cosmic aligning of your specialty suddenly being blasted into the news cycle as the biggest story of the day. It's the one and only time that'll ever happen. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I can while it's while it's going on. Exactly. OK, so to kind of just jump into this. There's been a lot of public discussion about, you know, what an insurrection really is, you know, what that term means. Trump's attorney at the Colorado arguments was trying to suggest, you know, it needed to be time limited and you needed to have the involvement of a standing army or or something on that scale to qualify. So, you know, what in your view is an insurrection? Well, so I testified about that at the Colorado trial, so I don't want to just rehash all of that. But one thing to keep in mind is that insurrections were common in the period from the founding until the Civil War. We tend to forget that. We we think of it as something that's rather strange or foreign, but it was more of a regular experience for people back then. Uh, because of one thing or another that led to people resorting to violence to express their opposition to some particular law and so on. So, I mean, basically what you need is a group of people 
who use violence for a public purpose, and they're doing that to hinder or obstruct the law. Now, that rules out certain things. It rules out, for example, violence directed against private property, let's say, and private property alone, or something done in secret, or something done by one person. Um, Section three applies an even higher standard by saying it has to be violence directed against the Constitution and trying to hinder or prevent its execution. So it's not just, say, any ordinary law. It's not state or local law. It has to be national, and it has to involve pretty directly the Constitution of the United States. Now, you can say, of course, that January 6th fits that definition to a T because what was going on was the use of violence by a group of people to prevent the 12th Amendment from being executed by the joint session of Congress, that is, in counting the electoral votes for President Biden. So, you know, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around the case, but also because it's been challenged. I mean, let me rewind a little bit. So the, this, there, there are a few challenges from the 1860s, which address some of the issues you just discussed around what constitutes an insurrection. You know, how did back then, how did those cases uh, approach this question? Like, I mean, how did judges like immediately after the Civil War regard what was an insurrection who might be disqualified under the statute, under the, under the amendment? Well, okay. After the Civil War, everybody understood that being part of the Confederacy was an insurrection. That is, you were participating if you were a participant in the Confederacy. So the question of what other things might count as an insurrection never came up in a court case. Now, there was discussion more generally about past insurrections, about the fact that Section 3 was meant to apply to future insurrections. Uh, There were also, during Reconstruction, declarations of insurrection when basically the Ku Klux Klan used violence to hinder or obstruct the law throughout the South. Uh, There were presidential proclamations about that. But there was never a Section 3 case in that period that dealt with anything other than being a part of the Confederacy. So that, of course, presents something of a challenge now for applying the provision because it was now we're looking at it in the context of a different insurrection. So, you know, we have this upcoming Supreme Court argument in this case. What do you think is the standard that the justices are likely to apply for finding that Trump engaged in insurrection? You know, like you can kind of see a world where they set a a very high bar for states to disqualify a presidential candidate under Section 3. Like, what do you think that might look like? I think they're going to pay a lot of attention to the First Amendment for two reasons. One, they understand the First Amendment. They deal with it all the time. So they will be very comfortable dealing with that in a way that they're not going to be comfortable dealing with all of these issues they've never seen before, because this is the first Section 3 case to ever reach the Supreme Court. Uh, Secondly, I don't think they're going to want to go through in a detailed way the facts as found by the trial court. That is, they're not going to really want to say, well, what about this tweet? What about this statement? What about that? How do we think about that? I think it's more a question of either they think as a whole the facts support a finding of engaging in insurrection, or they think that the First Amendment basically shields all of it and you don't have to look at the details at all. Mm. Uh, Now, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the course of the argument. Of course, the briefs are going to be talking about the First Amendment a fair bit. Some of the ones that have come in have done that already, and there are more to come. If the Supreme Court goes the route that you just described, they focus on the First Amendment, is there a risk that their ruling impinges at all on the January 6th criminal case against Donald Trump? Like, could their ruling, you know, by saying that his speech doesn't uh, qualify as him engaging in insurrection, could that affect the Jack Smith case at all? No, I don't think so, because first of all, these are on different tracks. This is a civil case, right? And those are criminal cases, first. Second, the criminal charges relate to things that are tied up in the facts of January 6th, but there is not a criminal charge of insurrection. So I think that you could still find Trump guilty in that criminal proceeding, no matter what the court says, even though, of course, what they say, you know, will, will, people will try to use it in the criminal case, but uh, it, it really shouldn't have that much of an impact, assuming they even reach the question of whether he engaged in insurrection at all. 
right? They may they may decide the case on some other ground. Right. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the jurisdictional arguments that Trump has raised. Um, you know, you got one whether Section three disqualification applies to the president, and then two, you know, whether Congress needs to legislate in order for Section three to be enforced. Um, and, you know, we have the case law that goes back to the 19th century, though there's been a handful of cases, um, you know, applying this question to others since January 6th. How have the courts generally kind of treated those arguments? Well, OK, on the question of whether Section 3 applies to the presidency, the Colorado Supreme Court went through that and concluded that it did. And there's right. quite a lot of evidence to support that point. And, and basically, you can think of that in a couple of ways. One is... Everybody at the time of Reconstruction agreed that Jefferson Davis could not be president unless he got amnesty from Congress. And the same was true for other Confederate leaders. So they, they knew that it, it had to apply to the presidency, at least to some extent. Secondly, the idea that you're going to say that the provision applies to everyone except the, or every office except the presidency would be a strange exception. Right. It would be like, well, why, why should that be? Uh, or what, what sense does that make? And it, it's no one's really supplied an answer to that. In other words, the, the best answer to that that's been given by Trump's attorneys and the other side on this case is, well, the text of the amendment says what it says and it doesn't say president. So that's why we should think the president is excluded. But that's really not how we approach constitutional language. You know, normally we, we, we read it as embodying a certain purpose, first of all. And secondly, we are not looking for every detail to be spelled out, right? The Constitution can't do that because it's fairly brief and it's quite old, right? Instead, you look at general language and you try to apply it consistently with other legal understandings. Okay, so that's the presidency part. Now, on the part about whether Congress has to legislate um, there's a lot of evidence from Reconstruction that people started enforcing Section 3 or thought it was apply, thought it applied before Congress had done anything to enforce it. Uh, Congress was giving amnesty to people before they attempted to enforce it through federal law. The Union Army was enforcing it in places before there was any federal statute. So there, the evidence is very til heavily tilted towards the side of saying that you can enforce it without an act of Congress. There is one case from 1869 that says the opposite. And there's been a lot of discussion of that case. I've criticized it quite a bit and did that before January 6th. So it, it was just, just in reading it and thinking about it. Uh, but um, if you take that case and you sort of see it for what it's worth, the conclusion is going to be actually that was wrong and that what everybody was actually doing at the time was enforcing it, even though there was no act of Congress to enforce it. Can you talk a little more about that one case, though? It, it's Griffin, Griffin's case, right? Solomon Chase. Like, can you yes. just give us more background on, I mean, what happened there and why you think it uh, is probably not going to apply in this situation? Sure. So uh, in Griffin's case, a black man was convicted of a crime in Virginia when Virginia was under military rule in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, he then brought a federal habeas corpus petition to Chief Justice Chase, who was, in those days, Supreme Court justices would also hear appeals and conduct trials in various parts of the country. So Chase was acting as an ordinary federal judge, really, rather than a Supreme Court justice. Okay. And Chase rejected the habeas petition and said that basically Mr. Griffin had to stay in prison because he said, uh, look, the claim was the judge that ran Griffin's trial was not eligible to be a judge because he had been in the Confederacy and was covered by Section 3. And Chase said, well, even if that's true, there's no act of Congress right now in Virginia, or at the time that the trial happened, that would apply Section 3 to people in Virginia. So therefore, the judge could not be seen as ineligible and the conviction was valid. Now, the trouble with that is, OK, but that doesn't explain why, for example, that must be so, because Chase didn't really offer much of an answer to that other than, well, it seems like a 
it would be impractical to say that a lot of things that have been happening in Virginia so far since the 14th Amendment was ratified would be sort of invalid or illegal because lots of ineligible people are in positions of power there. Hmm. Um, And the other issue is that he didn't say why state law could not provide the mechanism by which you enforce Section 3. There was no state law in Virginia at the time to enforce Section 3 because it was under military rule. Um, And everybody now agrees that, look, you need state law, in this case, Colorado election law, in order to enforce Section 3. You can't just enforce it in the absence of any federal or state law that provides a cause of action. But Chase was saying, in his opinion, well, only an act of Congress can do that. But he never explained why that was the case. And it really doesn't make any sense. State law is used to enforce the federal constitution all the time, and it can do so in this case. That makes sense. So I wanted to also kind of go back to the president question. Um, I, you know, William Bode, one of the authors of the Federalist, of of that paper arguing, you know, over the summer, widely circulated that uh, Section 3 does in fact apply to Trump and disqualifies him. He has this sort of like funny argument that because Trump is the only president to have never held another office, uh, the Supreme Court could rule in a way which only disqualifies Trump, right? Because he's he he only ever took the presidential oath. He didn't take the gubernatorial oath, like George W. Bush, or the senatorial oath, like uh, Obama or Biden. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what you think about that argument, and kind of more broadly, is there a way on any of these jurisdictional questions for the court to kind of get out of having to reach the merits? Like, is there like are there any kind of easy ways out for them where they can? you know, to kind of dismiss the case, one of these threshold issues without having to reach these like really thorny questions of did Trump in fact engage in insurrection? Right. Okay. So two, two parts to that. So the first part is, yes, Trump's argument is that when he took the oath of office, he was not an officer of the United States under section three, that presidents are not officers of the United States. And unlike every other president since 1868, He never held any other position before becoming president. So, for example, President Biden, whatever you think of him as whether he was an officer of the United States as president, he took an oath of office many times as a senator. Right. So he's covered by Section three. Everybody agrees with that. And every other president since 1868 is covered by Section three because of prior positions that they held where they took an oath to support the Constitution. So Trump is just unique in that he's the only president who never held any kind of position like that before becoming president. So that would mean if you accepted his argument, he would be the only former president, current or former president, not covered by Section 3. So then you have to ask again, yeah, but why? Why should that be? Now, if it were perfectly clear that the Constitution created a special exception for Donald Trump, then you'd have to follow it. Right? Because that's what it would say. But it, it is by no means clear. In fact, it doesn't really say that at all. But but the point being, OK, when it's there isn't a clear something in the text, then to have an exception for one person like that is sort of not reasonable and just is kind of something that I don't think the court's going to accept. Now, are there other ways for them to get rid of the case without ruling on the merits? Sure, there are plenty of ways they could do that. Um, one example would be the Colorado Republican Party is saying, look, we have a First Amendment right to put anybody we want on our primary ballot, even if they're ineligible. OK, now, if they accepted that argument, all that would do is kind of kick the can to the summer. Right. So after the Republican convention and he's the official nominee, well, then people could come back and say, okay, now primary's over. Now we're going to challenge him for the general election ballot. Okay. Or the court could say, look, uh, really, people who are ineligible can run. They can run for office. Maybe they can't hold office, but they can run for office. So if he wins, then come back to us after November and say, okay, well, now can he be president? Right. But but we don't need to decide that yet. Now, I would argue that these are all bad choices, that the court should just bite the bullet and decide one way or another now whether he is eligible or not, because otherwise you're creating a lot of uncertainty and you're just going to make the problem worse in the event that Trump wins 
in November, because try to imagine what it would be like to have this case be heard in the narrow period of time between November and January when he is, when people think he's a president elect and then Supreme Court may come in and say, well, is he really right? And that's not good mm-hmm. to use a, to use a, to use a fancy <laughs> technical term. Are those what you just kind of played out? Are those the two big ways that the court could kind of kick the can down the road on this? You know, could they play the delay game with any other, you know, kind of uh, avoidance of the the thrust of the issue in the hopes that maybe it'll kind of work itself out without them having to intervene? Those are the two main ways. I mean, another possibility, though this is pretty unlikely, is they could say, look, it's just up to the joint session of Congress next January to decide this question. So we can't decide it at all. It's just up to Congress in the joint session. Now, the problem is, right, if we had not had January 6, 2021, that might sound like a reasonable solution. But having seen what that's like, I don't think the court's going to make a decision that basically forces that to be the way it gets decided, because everybody understands that could be very chaotic and frankly, bring on more violence. So I don't think they're going to do that, although that would be a way of, in effect, not just delaying it, but taking themselves out of the equation entirely and saying, it's not our call. It's up to the joint session next January 6th. Right. So I think uh, kind of conventional wisdom right now holds that the Supreme Court will pretty summarily overturn the Colorado Supreme Court, um, you know, to some extent because of the partisan alignment with Trump. Like, how are you reading the tea leaves on this one? Well, I mean, look, it's impossible to know because they've never had a case like this before. So there's no track record that you can look at. Right. Um, I'll, I'll give you kind of a, an analogy maybe one or two of them. Um, (laughs) When the Affordable Care Act was challenged, Obamacare, at the beginning, people thought, oh, well, the Supreme Court will never seriously consider striking down some major statute like that. That would just be impossible to imagine. Then when they got to the argument, of course, people realized, no, actually, it's a close case. Now, they did end up upholding it, Okay, but it was by no means a sure thing. You could say the same about Bush versus Gore, right? That is to say, again, at the beginning of that, people said, oh, well, Supreme Court will never get involved in uh, a kind of recount of a presidential election in a state. And even if they do, there's, there's no way they would really say that a state can't do what Florida was doing at the time. Okay, well, turned out that was wrong. Now, the, the, the point here is to say, when you have cases that are very high profile and that don't have precedent behind them, right, then there is a tendency to kind of uh, miss the possibility that it's going to be closer than you think. And so that, you know, and just the fact that the conventional wisdom is as you describe it, which it is, probably means it's wrong. <laughs> right. I mean, that, that is, a, or at least it's a red flag. Okay. Most people think that way. Hmm. Is that really true? And so we'll, we will, we will see. Right. But um, it, I think it's, it's a closer case than people realize. Mm-hmm. So there's something kind of here uh, relatedly with, I think, basically with conservative justices where, you know, they have this, they kind of adopt this pose of their originalists and they're interpreting the constitution, damn the real world, real world consequences, right? The constitution says what it says, and we all have to live with that. It's kind of a rhetorical pose, but it's often sort of what the message is. Um, but I mean, do you think that's going to survive this case? Uh, I mean, do you think they're going to kind of adopt that pose? Like, I mean, basically, do, do you think they're not going to think really like, do you think they're going to resolve this without thinking what the real world consequences would be of disqualifying Trump? I think it varies by the judge. I mean, I don't think you can uniformly describe all of the justices as people who are equally formalistic, okay, or equally willing to set consequences aside. Some are more willing to do it than others. And this will be an interesting test of how willing they are to to do that 
or how willing they are to rule against perhaps the president that put them on the court, right? <laughs> or just sort of the kind of maybe certain setting aside certain assumptions that you might make about how they're going to vote because they were appointed by a Republican president, right? As opposed to a Democratic president. My one prediction I would kind of, I don't know that I could make any of them confidently, but <laughs> I will say that I think at least one of the justices will will not vote in the predictable way. Okay. <laughs> so there is not going to be, I don't think it's going to be six to <laughs> three, Trump is on the ballot with the usual six and the usual three. It will break down differently. And there could be, a, you know, at least one conservative justice who says he's disqualified. There could be at least one liberal justice who says that he's not, hmm. um, which would be good. Right. In the sense of saying, well, then people would realize actually it's a legal question, not a political question. Right. But I also think, you know, you see opinion about this case it is not breaking down according to standard liberal conservative Splits. You mentioned Professor Bode mm -hmm. and Paulson's article. Of course, they're leading originalists. They think Trump is disqualified. There are liberal scholars who think Trump's not disqualified. And, and they've been writing op-eds and such. So, I mean, that's both good because that means people are looking at it from a point of view of law more so than just politics or they're out of their usual boxes. But I think that will carry over to how the court looks at it. Mm hmm. So, you know, let's say just for fun that the court, to everyone's shock, does agree to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court um, and, and say, you know, they would, would the trial court's finding that Trump engaged in insurrection then be applicable nationwide um, or would that is that just siloed to Colorado? Like, how does that work? It depends. So the court could say each state gets to make its own decision about that. And of course, there are states where you really can't bring a challenge at all to the qualification of a presidential candidate, sometimes just in a primary, sometimes mm -hmm. for primary or general election. It's hard to say whether they want to go that way versus saying, OK, we're setting forth a uniform rule. And so if we think that he's disqualified, then he's disqualified nationwide. Now, it's worth pointing out also that if they were to disqualify him, either partially or entirely, Congress still has the ability under Section 3, by a two-thirds vote of each house, to give him amnesty and give him a waiver to clear him to run in every state or you know, put him back on the ballot in every state. And that will at least be taken up, right? I mean, whatever you think the chances are of that happening or something <laughs> else. But, but I mean, people will push for legislation to do that because they're going to be upset, yeah. right, if the court were to rule that way. And, and there will be at least efforts in Congress to overturn the court's decision, which the Congress can do under this sort of special procedure that Section 3 lays out. So I wanted to also ask about one thing. You know, there's kind of an odd thing here where there actually has been one person who's already been disqualified from office for his participation in January 6th. And that's Cooey Griffin, this New Mexico County Commissioner. So it, it, would, it seems like it would be weird to live in a world where he's the only one who's disqualified for involvement in this event. So I'm curious, I mean, how much weight do you think that that case might add to the effort to disqualify Trump before the Supreme Court? Well, only a little bit. I mean, I don't think that the Supreme Court is terribly interested in what happened to a county commissioner <laughs> in New Mexico, right? And, and one thing that, the weird thing that happened in that case was he, he didn't successfully appeal because he messed up the paperwork and, and so his appeal was just dismissed without being decided. If there had been an appeal and the New Mexico Supreme Court had ruled on it and upheld the disqualification, well, that would have counted for more because it was a state Supreme Court opinion rather than a trial court opinion. Uh, you, you are correct, though, that it would be very odd to say that the only person to be disqualified for involvement in January 6th is a county commissioner in New Mexico, <laughs> yeah. right? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, now, you could say, well, if nobody else was challenged, okay, you know, that's, that's the reason. But other people are being challenged. And 
it doesn't really make sense to say the, the, the lower, lower level person is disqualified and the top person isn't. Uh, now, whether that'll come up in the argument or not, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but yes, big picture wise, that, that really is, seems kind of preposterous. And you mentioned earlier a little bit about what January 6th, 2025 might look like, assuming the Supreme Court, you know, kind of kicks this to Congress. But can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how that might, I mean, I, I know it's a nightmare scenario and we're kind of pretty far down the lane of speculation, but I am curious, you know, if you could have a situation where Congress is just not certifying Trump electors because, um, you know, they deem him disqualified under the under section three. Well, okay, let's think about a couple of different ways in which that could happen, right? So one would be that the issue might be presented no matter what the Supreme Court does. That is, imagine the Supreme Court says Trump is eligible to run and be president. Well, that doesn't preclude people in Congress next January 6th from saying, we, we think the Supreme Court got that wrong. Uh, they might especially say that if between now and then Trump is convicted in a criminal case of felonies, then they might say, oh, well, you see, the Supreme Court decided this before the felonies, and now is a different situation. So that's going to happen probably no matter what the Supreme Court does if Trump wins. Okay. Now, if the court in effect says it's up to Congress to decide, we're not deciding, right? Well, that creates a lot of problems. For example, presumably it could mean that Trump's running mate, whoever that is, that is a person who would be the vice president elect at that point, could become the president, right? In the same way that that would be true if the president elect dies in between November and January, then the vice president, or not November, January, but if the vice president elect becomes president, if the president elect dies under the 20th amendment within a certain window of time. Uh, but there are all sorts of uh, weird kind of parliamentary kind of uh, tactics that can be used to prevent the election of a vice president elect, to try to hold things up in a joint session, the Electoral Count Act was reformed after the mm -hmm. last January 6th. It's not been tested, right, either in court or just through use. So people will have questions about that. It, it would just be really terrible. So <laughs> and, 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 and really terrible in the sense that there would be a more direct constitutional issue being presented rather than the sort of uh, made up issues that were presented to Vice President Pence, let's say, on mm -hmm. the last January 6th, uh, because it's one thing to reject those. It's another thing when people have a bone of more of a strong basis, let's say, for making a claim that, look, the Constitution says he's ineligible and the Supreme Court has not sort of ruled on that question or has said that Congress has to rule on it. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, when we chatted about this a, a few months ago for a story, um, you'd said that it might not be that legally it's such a tough question and that the more kind of driving force here might be that it's quite something to take such an unprecedented step, especially in this kind of, you know, in this environment about someone who's running for president and all that kind of thing. You know, do you do you still kind of feel that way? Yes. The history of the 14th Amendment is people often find it hard to do what it's telling them to do, <laughs> yeah. especially when they encounter it for the first time, whether it's to say that certain kind of racist practices are unconstitutional or to say mm -hmm. that certain kinds of fundamental rights are guaranteed to everyone. Because people always start out by saying, oh, do we really have to do that? Isn't there a way we can avoid that or kind of put that off to some other time. Um, we don't want history to repeat itself, but that doesn't mean it won't, right? And so best we can say is, well, look, unlike the situation in 1870, 1880, okay, now we know, right? There's a lesson there to be learned about what happens when the Supreme Court sort of sets a 14th Amendment aside, 
and says, well, we're, we're just going to do things that are sort of not going to rock the boat. Mm-hmm. Okay. And well, people suffer. And that same, that, that's a warning that the court should heed when they think about this case and they are presented with a similar kind of dilemma. Yeah. Okay. Gerard, thanks so much for talking to us today. This has been so helpful. Thanks You're so welcome. Much. Yeah, we'll keep an eye. Much to come. <laughs> We're going to be in for uh, your topic of choice, I think, <laughs> is going to continue running our lives for a bit. So I'm sure we'll be back in touch soon. Belaboring the Point with Kate Riga is a TPM podcast. The show is hosted by me, reporter Kate Riga. The show is produced by the excellent Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to our good friend, Why Not Jansveld, for our podcast theme song. And thanks to our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.